Being a fly on the wall gave an almost voyeuristic quality to her photographs for Rolling Stone in the 1970s. And in 1975, another Rolling Stone by the name of Mick Jagger invited Leibovitz into his world. When Mick Jagger asked me to, to be the tour photographer, I jumped at it, you know. It, I remember Jan Winner said to me that he couldn't guarantee that, that I would have a job when I came back to Rolling Stone if I, if I did this. And uh, he was not very happy about me going off to do it. She actually came on the whole tour, which is like a very long time to, um, to want to photograph. Leibovitz had by this time been working for the magazine for five years, photographing the biggest stars in the music industry. But going on tour with a rock band opened her eyes to what it really meant to be a Rolling Stone. I was so lucky, and I've tried to say this many, many times, I was interested in photography, you know, and not rock and roll or music or what, you know, I, I was interested in always trying to get a great photograph. I just thought, well, God, the, the tour, that's great, we're going to all these different cities, we're going to be staying at the best hotels in, in every town, they're going to have a tennis pro there, so I'm going to take some lessons, and that's what I'll do. And of course, you know, Two days into the tour, I, I never saw the daylight again. I mean, I was up all night. It's a romantic story. I mean, it, can you imagine? I mean, being young, being on the road with the Rolling Stones, you know, doing everything and, you know, holding on tight to my camera. She was so bored after a while of photographing Rolling Stones. You know, there's only so much you can do. And um, I think that's what drove her to feminism. But anyway, uh, she's... <laughs> I keep looking at you guys all the time. I just keep looking at. But <laughs> she, uh, when she'd finished doing that, she used to photograph the the audience, and I think there's a, some good pictures of that period when she does all these audience snaps, which in some ways are just as interesting, but more so than the band. I became very interested in the audience. I would spend a lot of time wandering through the audience, and looking at the audience. And I would watch people sort of give themselves up. I didn't see the photograph as adulation, I actually saw it as desperation. People sort of smashed against a chain link fence. It was very poetic, you know, um, but it looked very painful to me. It's very difficult to photograph music. It's, it's something in the air, but you can uh, photograph the energy and you know what it takes. You know, I don't think anyone realizes the kind of strain one is on when they're on stage. I like to call it my Francis Bacon, you know, because it has a very gory quality to it. In a certain way, you know, I was trying to show uh, that, that life on the road was not glamorous, you know, that the idea of propelling one's body through space a lot faster than it's meant to go um, took its toll. And their lifestyle, you know, it was a very hard lifestyle. and. Um, you know, I was trying to, to show, uh, to try to de-romanticize it, you know, to, to, to show a side that was not so pretty. Going on tour with the greatest rock band was too seductive an opportunity to turn down. The consequences, however, of being one of the boys was something felt in the morning when the booze and the drugs started to wear off. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll was part of the package, and unlike her previous assignments where she would pop in and out, Leibovitz was entrenched for the whole tour. It wasn't very work orientated, uh, and there was a lot of um, sort of hanging out, and, and, and taking drugs and so on, all that sort of thing. More so, perhaps, in the 60s, or just different drugs from the 60s. So it was that era, and uh, yeah, I think that, that that Annie did a lot of pictures that. Um, remember that or reflect that when you look at them. I think she was very um, aware of all that. I mean, she was very much part of it. Um, she was a sort of hands-on. She wasn't like a f so much as a fly on the wall as a kind of a one of the guys, you know, taking part in everything. She liked to be one of the guys. You know, I basically gave myself up to whatever was going on and felt that that was what one did as a as a uh, as a journalist or as a uh, you know in that kind of reportage work that in order to get the best work you had to sort of totally be involved and 
People talk about the soul of the sitter, but there's also the the soul of the photographer. And you know, I basically almost lost you know my soul. I mean, it wasn't the Rolling Stones' fault. You know, it was it was my fault for allowing myself to, you know to give myself up. You know, to go to go in something so deeply that you know I let it you know overtake me. She's very very hardworking. She's fantastically um, perfectionist. I think. She would get so furious if, you, if something went slightly wrong. And, but she would really push the subject to the point of torture, I think, almost. Jan Wenner advised Annie against going for the whole tour, knowing the destructive consequences of that environment. But by the end of the tour, Annie left with a lifelong friendship with the Rolling Stones, a reputation as the number one photographer in the world of rock music, and a drug addiction. After the success of her Rolling Stones tour, Leibovitz found her fame a hindrance to the documentary style of photography she was used to. Her subjects were too aware of her presence, and it was a struggle getting the same authenticity. This period also brought a big change to Rolling Stone magazine when they moved their headquarters from San Francisco to New York City.